Can you hear me? Grab that. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Is it working? Okay, well, I think I can. It is supposed to be recording anyway, so. Um, welcome to the session Understanding Drupal. Uh, thanks for being here. My name is Mauricio Dinarte. I am Dean Arcon in pretty, where, uh, pretty much everywhere in the internet. I am from Nicaragua. Um, we have beautiful lakes, volcanoes, and lakes within volcanoes, so we're very meta. Uh, you know, during the cold winter here, it is very hot in Nicaragua, so if you want to take a vacation, it is, it is a good place to go. I work for a company called Agaric. We are based in Boston, but we have um, people from you know USA, Nicaragua, Mexico, Germany, and England. We are a small company, but you know, pretty distributed team. This is an outline of what we're going to cover. Uh, you know, the idea is to give a, an overview of how the system works as a whole, so you can have a better understanding and you can make you know informed decisions when when there is a need for that. Uh, to my surprise, this this session has been really useful for project managers. That it, it was never the intent, but you know, based on feedback, that is what I get. Uh, why to use Drupal? Uh, some of examples of websites that use Drupal include the White House, Weather.com, the Grammys, Web Economic Forum, Examiner.com. Naranja Tradicional de Gandia. It is not hard to pronounce for me because I speak Spanish and this is a business in Barcelona, Spain. And you know, they have a, they sell oranges, tangerines, lemons, marmalade, sweets, and honey. So you know, even though they are really high profile websites building Drupal, some small companies are able, you know, to use the software to, you know, run their business. In this case, selling six products online. And Tesla Motors also is built on Drupal. The cars themselves do not run Drupal, but you know, <laughs> we're there already, at least. Uh, some of the features that make Drupal so appealing to these kind of websites is its security. One thing to note, uh, you know, Drupal is not bulletproof, but there is a team of about 40 people ar around the world that they are experts in security and they make sure that the software that we use is you know protected, and when a new vulnerability is discovered, uh, they you know fix it right away. Uh, and you know in the White House, that's you know they need security, and they decided to to use Drupal. So I think we can we can be pretty sure that Drupal is safe. Uh, also, Drupal is multilingual, so in particular in Drupal 8, the capabilities of multilingual Drupal are better than ever. And you know, you can have your website in English, in Spanish, in Farsi, and you can actually invent your own languages, and you, you just need to give it a name and it will work. Right to left, right, uh, left to right, it doesn't matter. Uh, Drupal supports, you know, doing e-commerce, like the example that I gave. Drupal supports hypes, load, load of traffic. Uh, Weather.com is the biggest site made, made in Drupal in terms of traffic, and one of the most visited websites in the world it receives about a billion visits per month, so that is a lot, and you know, Drupal can scale to that. In Drupal 8, um, in Drupal 7 it is possible, but in Drupal 8 it comes out of the box. You have a lot of tools to make your site responsive, so you know, either a phone, a tablet, a desktop computer, or a 4K monitor, you can you know, make your design look beautiful to whatever you know, audience you are serving. And in Drupal also supports managing multimedia, like in the case of the Grammys. On the day of the event, they live stream the whole thing. And in addition to that, you know, in the backstage, they post pictures, images, audio files, and so on. So there is a really high demand of, you know, ma managing multimedia, and Drupal deal with all of, deal with all of that. Uh, now, we know why we want to use Drupal, now we, uh, what, it is, what is Drupal? Depending on who you ask, Drupal can be many things to many people. Today I'm going to focus on the CMS side, side of things, but we're going to go over two other ones. Uh, as a CMS, and this is not exclusive to Drupal, any CMS can do this. Uh, 
it allows multiple people to, to participate in the creation of content. So, you know, sharing credentials, that is your username and password, is unnecessary. So if we all work for the same organization, like each of us can have username and password, and, and if I, am, I do something wrong, then Drupal will know that I am the one who did it, I will be accountable, and my account can be, you know, disabled or blocked without affecting any of you. Uh, it is also possible to establish publication workflows. For example, if you have a newspaper, um, you can have like the journalist who has permissions to write articles, but they need to be reviewed before they appear you know, publicly. So the journalist only has permission to create articles. Then there is an editor who has permission only to edit articles that were written by someone, by someone else. So the editor cannot create articles by him, you know, for, for by himself or herself, only reviewing what someone else already did. But let's say, just for the sake of example, that um, the editor is not allowed to make it, you know, published by default. You need the final review or the final check, you know, by a department head. So this department head won't be able to create nor edit. His only responsibility will be uh, check one last time, and if everything is okay, you know, just say, make it public. So it is a very simple use case, but you have three different people with three different uh, responsibilities. So Drupal can be used to map that, you know, scheme. Drupal also, out of the box, come with content revisioning. Content revisioning means keeping track of records, and Drupal will keep track of everything. Like, if you modify one word, if you add one image, it will keep track of that. In addition of keeping track of that, it will keep track of who did the change and when, by date and time. And in addition to that, uh, let's say that I did something wrong, I modified some content to you know something that shouldn't be on the website. So if I have content revision in enabled, then Drupal will like let me know, there has been so many changes on these dates by these people. If you don't want what you have now, you can revert back or go back to a previous revision, and you know it will let you know what is the difference, and you just click, yeah, I want the revision from two days ago. You click save, and that's it. You don't have to do anything else. Uh, it, it comes enabled out of, uh, by default, but you, know, you can tur turn it off if, if you don't need that functionality. Uh, Drupal also allows granular access control over every piece of information. Let's assume that we have um, an e-commerce website. So in the e-commerce website, we present the same information to everyone, except for the price. Because let's say we sell you know, to the general public, but we also have some VIP members. And the VIP members will have a discount. So uh, you know, if someone comes to the website, like it, it is not a VIP member, they will see images, descriptions, you know, related products, everything the same. When the VIP member comes, they will be they will see exactly the same as, except for the price fees. So you can be as granular as you want. You can you know hide or show one piece of information, complete section of your website or your whole website if you want. Like if you want your website only available to people with username and passwords, you can also do that. It is up to you to decide. Drupal is also a framework, and in this sense, uh, you can program in PHP to extend Drupal beyond what it was originally planned for. For example, Drupal was never planned to be an e-commerce platform, but you know, because Drupal do so, do, does so much, someone decided, okay, I have, let's say, 80% of my website already done with Drupal. I only need to build the e-commerce side of things. So they decided to write the code for that, you know, and they created modules and themes, you know, they created a, what is called a distribution, and using the framework, they now have, you know, an e-commerce platform. Drupal can also be used as the data storage of your backend application, so if you want to, you know, Android or iOS applications, you can store the information in Drupal and expose that content through an API. And finally, Drupal is a community, and in my humble opinion, this is the most important aspect of Drupal. You know, there are over 200 co uh, countries, over 150 languages, over 3,000 co code contributors. You know, that 
that particular one speaks a lot about the quality of the software. You know, no one can be expert in everything, but when over 30,000 people, you know, contribute, the, it, is, it is really solid, the product. And there are, but as of now, like about a million uh, people using Drupal around the world. And it is said that about 2% of all the websites in the world use Drupal. Some basic concepts. Uh, if you feel that I'm going too fast, for one, you know the reason, and for the other one, uh, there are a lot of things that I want to cover. I will try to go slow because I prefer that you have like a solid understanding of the very basic things instead of covering everything. But feel free to interrupt me if if I go too fast. And at the end of the session, you know, I will be around. We can continue. You can ask any question you have. So. Before going any further, I want to uh, make a difference between what is a website and what is a web page. So a website, let's say Amazon.com. Amazon.com is the website, and there are a lot of web pages. One for each product, one for the home page, one for each department, one for each section. So that is the difference. One website can have one or many web pages. Each web page is going to be identified by a URL. In this case, like the slash represents the home page, and in this example, I have an about page, a team page, services, articles, and contact pages. And assuming that the article page is a listing of you know, several articles, each article will be its own page. So as you can see, one single website, many web pages. Now, when we have one, uh, one web page, everyone here uses the internet to some extent, so we have some predefined concepts, like, uh, for example, we can say, oh, we have a header, a footer, some sidebar, some content in the middle, so we already have some knowledge. The purpose of this session is to map that any knowledge that we already have to what Drupal call this stuff internally. So there are some words that are not intuitive, but we're going to explain them. And by the end of the session, we should be able to look at this picture again and identify, oh, that is a node, oh, that is a blog, oh, that is a view, and so on. Uh, the first concept that uh, I'm going to cover is core. So core is the minimum required software that you need in order to run a Drupal project. If you don't have core, it is not Drupal. It can be WordPress, and a static website, it can be something else, but not Drupal. You need Drupal core to be a Drupal project. When you go to drupal.org, uh, there is a link that says get the code. Uh, when you go to that link, you have the option to download either a zip file or a targc file. That file contains many more files. That thing is Drupal core. Among several uh, things, Drupal core comes with modules and themes. We're going to cover those next. And again, Drupal Core is the framework on, on, top, of, on top of which you can build more stuff. Uh, modules and themes. So modules are responsible for adding functionality to the website. And themes control appearance. Uh, let's say that I, I, am writing a, uh, I am writing blog posts. And I want that every time that I write a blog post, some things goes to Twitter, like a tweet is automatically sent, or something is uh, created in my fa Facebook page, like a post in my Facebook page, automatically every time that I write a blog post. That is functionality. And if, if it is functionality, it will be provided by a module. On the other side, if it's something visual, let's say the font size, the font face, the colors, or how the layout is going to behave, on a smartphone, on a tablet, or a, on a desktop computer, anything that has to do with appearance, it's going to be controlled by the theme. So there is a very clear separation of responsibilities. Functionality is the responsibility of modules. Visual appearance is responsibility of the theme. And then, you know, we have core, which has modules and themes, but we also have the content repository. The country repository has also modules, themes, and distribution. We already covered the first two. Uh, distributions are pre-packed uh, Drupal uh, versions that come tailored for a very specific use case. 
For example, there is a distribution called Open Church. If you want to build a site for a church, that one will come with, you know, a calendar, with services, with managing multimedia to upload sermons and stuff. So it is Drupal, but with extra functionality already, you know, configured for you. You, you can also extend that to, you know, to your specific uh, church in this case, but you will have a lot more than Drupal core out of the box. And distributions are like, like 200 or so. There is one for e-commerce websites, one for churches, one for nonprofits, uh, one for newspapers, one for governmental sites, and so on. In fact, uh, some of you might have already been using distribution without knowing. This is very common in universities. Like, you know, universities have a lot of departments and one university can have a hundred or a thousand websites and they need some kind of a standardization. So the university will create a distribution for the university and every time that a new site is created, then they will start with that base. Okay, now we, I said that I'm going to focus on the content, CMS part of things. So the very first concept that we're going to encounter is Node. What is a Node? Uh, to be honest, this is a really confusing term, but to be fair, this is a term that has, been, that has existed for over 15 years. So when you are you know, a young developer in your dorm, you know, playing with code, how do I call these things? It's a node, okay. But a node uh, nowadays, uh, it's a piece of information that can tell a story by itself. For example, we have the picture of this car. What things can we tell about this car? For one, we can, uh, it's, it's red. We can also say the year, the make, the model, the number of, door, the number of doors or windows. We can say if, you know, if, it uses, if it uses gas or if it is an electric car or hybrid. You know, many things. We can describe many property, properties of this car. So in Drupal, if we want to represent a car, then we're going to use a node. And the node is going to be this container of information. Some properties that all nodes have are the following. Um, all node, this is an example of a node in a Drupal website. All nodes will have a title. All nodes will have a, an author and a publication date, including like day and time. All nodes will have an internal identifier, which is a number. So the first node is node one, and then it increments by one every time. So the second one, node two, node three, node four. But let's say that I write a really good blog post, and I want to share it with my friends. Then, oh, go to my website, agarit.com slash node slash 345. You know, that's really hard to remember. Humans remember uh, words more easily than numbers. So in addition to, have it, to having the internal identifier, all nodes have something that is called URL alias. So in this case, the alias is blog slash altering views results, which actually is derived from the title of the node. So that is easier to remember. Drupal, no, let's say this is node one, I can use either node one or the alias, and I will always get this node. Uh, in addition to this, there are things that we don't see. For example, the publication status that I mentioned before, it is not visible, but if I, is, I, like, I can create a node and save it as a draft. By saving as a draft, I said it is only visible to the content administrators or content creators. And you know, I can start writing a news article, but maybe I don't have all the information, so I can save it as a draft and then make it like publicly available in the future. Uh, the text that we see at the bottom, those are fields, and we're going to cover fields uh, to a higher extent later. But for now, you know, those are some properties that all nodes shares. And one, yes? So can you, can you also say a node is a page? Uh, so the question is, the node is a page? Uh, yes, all nodes are pages but not all pages are nodes, and we're going to cover that later. Some pages can be the results of nodes, others can be the results of views, others can be the results of modules. Uh, we're going to cover views and modules later, so you will be able to tell the difference between one and the other. Uh, 
you know, so in the example that I gave before, it was a car. In the example that I have here, it's a news article. And this, uh, you know, lays, uh, or, or this indicates that you can use nodes to store information about physical objects and non-physical objects. So for example, another physical object that, that I can describe using a node, it's a, an event just like this one. So we are at BATCAM. BATCAM happened on a specific date, in, in a specific location, you know, and there are so many things that we can describe about an event. So, you know, you can use a node for that too. We talk about cars, can we have more wheels, of course. So, you know, I can also describe motorcycles, more, uh, bicycles, tricycles, in addition to cars. So let's say that, you know, I am a retailer and I sell all of this stuff, then, uh, you know, I want to make this information available to the people that come to my website looking for cars or motorcycles. Um, then one, um, I need to, f to have a way to tell uh, the content apart from each other. So let's say that I am only interested in cars and not motorcycles, maybe because I don't know how to ride a motorcycle. Then I want to create a page that lists only cars, nothing else but only cars. So one way to do that in Drupal is using content types. So content types is an abstraction that allows to group nodes that share similar characteristics or describe the same idea. Uh, for example, you can have a template, uh, excuse me, a content type for cars, another one for motorcycles, another one for events, another one for articles, and so on. For anything, like any idea that you want to store information about, you can create a content type. And the content type will serve as a template to collect information. Uh, we're going to see that later. And the content type is used to uh, one of the things that they provide is ease of uh, managing the configuration that we have. For example, uh, we can you know we can say show me only the cars by content type. Uh, I mean show me all the nodes by content type. So all the cars, all the motorcycles, all the events, and so on. One really important thing to note between the relationship of a node and a content type is that every node has an associated content type. It is possible to have content types without nodes, but to be honest, that is not useful. And it, if, if you don't have content types without nodes, don't have it at all. But uh, every node will, will have a content type associated with it. In this example, like the number represents the node ID. So node ID one, it's an article. Node ID two, it's a basic page. Node ID three, it's a car. And I can have like many nodes of the same content type. Uh, can a node belong to several content types? The question is, can a node belong to several content types? And the answer is no. Each node can only can have one and only one content type. And once you create a node, you cannot change the content type. Okay, so that being said, let, let's assume that, okay, we have a retailer store, we already have a, a means to separate all the cars from everything else in my website, so I only have cars here. But I want to go a little bit further. Like, I am interested in particular of red cars. I love red cars. So I only want to see red cars. And maybe I only want to see red cars that are Toyota, Yaris from 2010 onwards. So. <laughs> Having only the content type is not enough. We need other ways to let the user find the information that they need. How do I do this in Drupal? Using fields. And fields are awesome. In the past, I have a really long slide, but it was really boring. So I decided to change it just to say fields are awesome. And instead of you know saying, uh, reading aloud a really long paragraph, I decided to give examples. So who has used either Facebook or Twitter here? At least once in, the, in his or her life. Some of us, not everyone, I understand some are very busy people, but I have used both. And you know, when you are using, let's say, Facebook, um, you have a small box where you can get inspired and write a poem if you want. Uh, 
you can write a poem, you can upload pictures, you can, uh, you know, upload videos and so on. But let's say that I am the retailer store and I have a fa Facebook page for my retailer store. And because I, am, I have a very successful business, I have a new car every day. So, you know, I start adding one post per car. Let's say that one month later, I already have 30 posts. If someone comes to, to my fa Facebook page looking for something, it will be really hard for them to find. Like, you know, even though Facebook has some search functionality, it is really hard to use. And also for Twitter, like in Twitter, you are even more restricted to, to the content and the things that you can do. So uh, the, where I'm going with this example is that uh, having just, you know, the freedom of writing anything uh, that is called free text search. Uh, I mean, that is called free text. S using uh, free text uh, to search, it is really difficult. Why? Let's see some examples. Free text allo allows you to have inconsistent data. For example, uh, let's say that we're describing an event and all of us work for the same organization and all of us are describing events. If we we, if we have the freedom to write, that, to describe the event any way we want, uh, let's say uh, no, someone writes November 19, 2015. Someone else writes no, like the abbreviation. Someone uses numbers and put the year in four digit format. Someone else uses two digit format. Someone else uses dashes instead of slashes. Or if you are from Nicaragua like I am, we put the day before the month. So, you know, there is a lot of chance for inconsistent data. And when you're performing a free text search, you are searching specifically for the string, like for the specific words and letters, letters and numbers. So this is going, like, there is no way that you can uh, make a useful search when you have inconsistent data. Data can also be invalid, like minus 10 years old, February 31st, in this case, the price, I am using the dollar sign, but I have the euro word, you know, wrong. The email is, is missing the ad sign, or what is your phone number? I am beautiful, smile, no, no. That's not even a number. So again, this is possible when you have, uh, when you have freeform uh, text. And, you know, freeform text, inconsistent data, and invalid data makes Drupal cry. So how can you make Drupal happy again? using fields. So fields is the solution for all of this. Uh, there are different types of fields in Drupal, and each one is configured in a different way. Uh, on the screen, on the right, yeah, on the right, you can see um, one field for that says price. So this is, let's say I am selling a car, uh, this is the field where I'm going to, to store the price of the car. For one, I can define a minimum. So this is like, right away I am able to define some validation. Uh, I can have a car for free. I don't know why, but let's say that's possible. But if I am selling something, I won't pay you to take it away. Like I can give it for free, but I won't pay you. So the price needs to be at minimum zero. I am not setting a maximum. Let's say if I want to sell a car by $1 million and someone pays, that's okay. Uh, if I am selling in the United States, I am pretty sure that always it's going to, be, the currency is, is always going to be US dollars. So I can use the dollar sign as a prefix and USD as a suffix, and there is no way that people can enter something else. Uh, I don't know if you notice at the top there is a blue check mark. It says required field. So if I am selling something, it needs to have a, a price. So Drupal won't allow you to save the node if you don't set a price. So that is the price field. Price field will allow me to store a number with decimal points and the validation criteria that I define you know, in the field configuration. Uh, on, the left, yeah. on the left, I have a field to store images. Let's say the image of the car. For one, you know, maybe I don't have the image. Maybe I know that the car is coming, but I don't have it in my garage yet to take the picture. So I will make it optional. You know, people will be able to come back to edit the note later and upload the photo later, but uh, it is possible to save the note without having the image. That being said, I can also define what image format I want to allow. In this case, PNG, GIF, JPEG, 
and JPG. Let's say that, you know, that GIF are used, you know, to have small funny videos on the web. If I don't want to allow, you know, cats appearing randomly in my website, I can disable GIF and that's it. That's the only change that I have to do. If I want it, I could define minimum and maximum for image resolutions. Let's say that I, I don't want people to upload big images, so no more than 120, uh, 1200 by, eight, by 800, for example, pixels. I can also define five mega, megabytes or whatever number that I define uh, as the maximum upload size. Like every file can be as, like the, the larger file will be five megabytes only. And uh, I can have an alt, uh, uh, alt field for images, and uh, this is used for accessibility. For example, for the visually impaired or you know people who use screen readers to navigate the internet, they won't be able to see the image. So the alt, which uh, stands for alternative, it's going to be you know a text field. Anything that you type there is going to be read out loud uh, by the by the screen reader. So that's important for accessibility. And when you use fields, Drupal is happier. Actually, a lot more happier. Uh, the recipe to make Drupal happy is as follows. You have one field for every piece of information that you want to store. In the example of the car, you will have one field for the color, one field for the year, for the make, for the model, and so on. Every piece of information is going to be its own field. Uh, in addition to that, you need to select the right type of field for the right type of information. That will allow you, among other things, to define validation criteria. And it will also optimize how Drupal stores the information internally. So some examples, we have inter integer, decimals, the difference there is that one are whole numbers and the other one can have decimal points. You can have images, phone, emails, URLs, and so on. Some examples. Uh, it, let's say this is a content type that stores information about organizations. So the title, it says Agari. That is a text field, a one-line text field. Then I have an image. I have a number field for where it says established in 2016. Even though that is, a te that is text, internally that can be configured as a number field. Why? Because I want to know when the organization was established. That means a year. The year is a number, and it is a whole number. So I can use an integer field. In the, you know, as, as we saw before, we can have prefixes for, for any field, of, I mean, for number fields. So in this case, I define a prefix of established in. So that string will appeal every time that this field is going to be presented to the user. So I'm being consistent. And I also can validate, let's say that I only want organizations that were uh, established on 2000, 2000 onwards, then they, I can specify a minimum of 2000 if I want it. And then we have like a multi-line text field. It is uh, important to know that Drupal makes a difference between single line and multi-line text fields. We have a URL field, an email field, a number field, a date field. Date fields, you have the option to also store the time. And the one that says services involved, that is a taxonomy. We're going to talk about taxonomies a little bit later. So, you know, all of this is fields, and fields can do a whole more than this. For one, fields are the ones uh, that determine how the information is collected in your website. Uh, for example, if we want to store geographical information, for example, this building is in one you know, geographical location in the globe. How do I identify this building in the globe? There are at least four ways. One is the address, like the human read address, the thing that we remember. We can also have a latitude and longitude, so if we know that, we can identify the point on the map. We can actually have a, a visual map, like an interactive map, and ask the user to click on it with, you know, point a marker on top of it. And, you know, in the same way that we have Word, Excel, PDF, and so on, there, there, is some, there are some file types used to store geographical information. One of those file, file types is called KML. So KML, uh, 
uh, if I am if I allow this, I can have a, a like an upload field in the same way that I can upload an image or a PDF file. I could I could upload an KML file, and that that file will have the information that I need to identify this building in the globe. So fields are flexible. Fields will allow me to get the information in more than one way. Uh, in practice, there is no field in Drupal that allows all these four. But what I want, the, the important thing here is the concept. It is possible that one field will allow the entering the information in more than one way. Uh, there are fields in Drupal that allows the fields too, like address and latitude and longitude, other fields that allow for maps and so on. You know, but the concept is what is important. Once the information is collected, it is stored in a standard format. And because the, the format is a standard, you can present the information also in many different ways. For example, you can collect the information in latitude and longitude, and you can present it to the user on a map. So the way that the information enters the system is not required to be the same, like in the way in the in the way that it comes out of the system. But you know, Drupal goes beyond. Drupal allows you to aggregate information. So let's say that we have this content type that stores information about events happening all over the world. So for one, I can aggregate that information and present a map. In addition of using the location field to put the market on the map, let's say that I have a category field that, okay, the category in this case would be Drupalcon, Drupalcam, user group, spring, training, or related. So I can use another field in my content type to color code the markers on the map. So I can combine the information of more than one fields in the presentation of aggregated, aggregated information. And you know, fields are awesome, as I said before. So another thing that we, it is possible to do with fields is to like hide and show a specific pieces of data. Like I can cherry pick, if I have a content type with, let's say, 10 fields, I can say I only want to show seven. I only want to show five, and the rest are going to be hidden. And you can go like crazy with this. You can say, in this scenario, let's say for the general public, I want to show eight. If you are a regular customer, I want to show nine. If you are a VIP customer, I want to show 10. Or let's say that if I am on a summary listing page, I only like the title and the description. But if you click on the full article, you get to see every field on the article. So, you know, fields are really flexible. And this is like what allows Drupal to be, you know, so versatile in the way that it presents information. Uh, and this is the slide that I had before. It's really boring, it's really long. So, but we already covered all the things. Uh, the only things that we, I haven't talked about is the filtering and sorting. So as I said before, when, when I had the, the load of cards and I want to perform a search for red, you know, for color, make, model, year, and so on, that it is possible to do those searches when you have those informations in fields. If you don't use fields, you have the blob of text, and then it is near to impossible to find something useful in them. So fields are the ones that will allow you, let's say, I want to, you, you know, in the card example, in the color field, red, in the year field, 2010 onwards, and so on. And also you can use the same field information for sorting. I can say, I want to sort the cards by, you know, mo most recent to oldest for example, and you need fields to do that. If you don't use fields, you cannot do this. Um, again, so far we have covered nodes, content types, and fields. So in this example, like in this, we have only covered the thing on the middle. Uh, so the middle is a node, and uh, the node ha uh, is of a specific content type, let's say an article, and I have an image field, a title field, a body field, a tagline field, and so on. The rest of the things, um, it's something else. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through these blocks. So blocks are container of extra information to be displayed, uh, to be displayed along the main region of the website. Uh, 
all blocks are placed in a thin region, things are going to make sense as I give the examples. So we already said that Drupal has themes. So themes have themes regions. Uh, and those are the places where you can put content. Uh, it, uh, each theme is, is responsible for determining the themes regions. And uh, this is Drupal out of the box. Drupal out of the box comes with a blue shade. That blue shade is a theme called Bartik. And that theme Bartik defines the regions that we see here. Each yellow rectangle is a region. So anywhere there is a yellow rectangle, we can put some content there. Why is there a blank uh, on the top right? Like that's not a region, or uh, can, can uh, you repeat? The blue part of like it's not a yellow box. Mm -hmm. so, is that because it's not a region? Like that's yeah. So uh, the question is like if the blue rectangle or area is not a region, is that the question? Uh, yeah, because you don't have the yellow. Yeah. Okay. Yellow. So uh, the question is if. Uh, the the blue thing is not a region because we have some yellow thing on the left. Uh, the the answer is only where there is a yellow thing you can put content, and those are the regions. And I'm going to give an example that m might clarify stuff. For example, uh, on the on the on the middle we have like the main content, and we have two sidebars. So. The right sidebar, if we don't put any block, if we don't put any content there, in the case of Bartik, Bartik <coughs> collapses the region. By collapsing, it means that it will, you know, like remove it, and the content region will expand to the right to use that space. The, it, is the same, it is the same for the left. Like, so if you don't have neither right or left, the content region will expand to use everything. It is not very noticeable, but there is a, gray stripe that says feature top in a rectangle, that is another region. If you don't put anything there, Bartik will collapse that region and you won't see any gray stripe. It will go from blue to white to black without the gray stripe. Um, how regions behave is determined by the theme. So every theme will have its own behavior. For example, some of the regions can be collapsed others won't be collapsed. In this case, in the footer, you can see that there are four columns in the black star at the bottom. If you put something, a block, in the third region, uh, it won't automatically expand to use the rest. So how this behaves depend on the theme. And right now, we're only viewing the desktop version. If we go to mobile, the, even though the left sidebar appears first on the mobile version, it will appear second below the content. So all of this behavior, how, one, uh, how the information is presented, uh, it's defined by the theme. And you can only place a stuff uh, on, you know, where there is a, a, a yellow stripe. In the case of Bartik, maybe it is not represented here, but if you, uh, it, you have sometimes a menu at the top of the page, and that menu is on the top right, so even though you don't visually see the region expanding the full width, it is possible for that to happen. Like this is a demonstration, but like, you know, you, to give you an idea of what regions you have available, but you know, the theme can in the end behave a little bit different. But this is like for reference. So I show this picture to indicate where you can put content, like where you can put blocks. But the main topic here is blocks. So I'm going to talk of four things about blocks. One, they can either be a static or dynamic. A static block is one whose content remains the same always, or almost always. For example, the footer, like copyright 2016, that will change once a year. Or in you know an event like this that we have a sponsor, we want to show a banner of that sponsor always. So, you know, we, that, that would be a static content block. But uh, we can also have dynamic content. For example, the latest blog post. If I write a blog post every day, that content, that blog will be updating itself every day. If I am selling products in a store and I have, you know, a new, a new products every week, that will be changing every week. So depending on how often the content changes, a blog can be either static or dynamic. 
Uh, blocks can also enforce visibility rules. So we already cover content types. I can say that some blocks are available for one specific content type. Let's say that we have uh, more articles uh, by the same author blog. You know, that, that makes sense in the article content type because, you know, one author can write a lot of articles. But that, uh, that blog doesn't make sense in the event content type because one event doesn't write blog posts. So in those cases, I can define this block, this block only makes sense for this specific content type or for this language. Like if I have a multilingual site, this blog is only relevant in the Spanish version of my website. Or uh, by pages, like only on the front page, only on the contact page, everywhere except on the team page or anything under the services section of my website. All those things, you know, by URL, you can define visibility rules based on that. And by roles, we haven't covered roles, but you can also define visibility rules based on roles. By default, none of them is selected. If none of this is selected, the blog will be visible all the time. Once you start, you know, filtering based on, you know, only on article, only on Spanish and so on, then, uh, you know, those visibility rules, rules will be respected by Drupal. Uh, blogs can be aware of their environment. For example, if you are displaying a blog of more authors by the same, more, more blog posts by the same author, then when, the, when Drupal is going to render the blog, okay, the blog will ask, who wrote the page that I'm going to be displayed at? Uh, it was written by Mickey. So, it is going to look into in the system for more articles written by Nikki. If then it, it goes to a, the user goes to a different article written by John, then okay, more articles written by John and so on. So a blog can modify the content that's going to be displayed based on its environment. And finally, blogs can have fields in the same way that content types can have fields. Blogs can have fields. And you know, an example of this can be a special offer blog. So I have a blog type with the following four fields, title, description, image, and expiration date. So I can configure the blog to appear on the right sidebar always until the expiration date arrives. So you know, blogs can have fields, and it, sometimes it makes sense for them to have fields. And the last things that I want to cover for now are views. Views, you know, we can talk the whole days about views, and there have been, you know, there have been books fully dedicated to this topic, so it is impossible for me to describe views shortly, but bear with me. This is my one slide summary of views. So views are listing of information. That information can be their notes, users, and some other things. So how does views work? You have a lot of content in your website. So the view is going to be used to scan all that, all, all that content using the fields that we described before. So let's say I want a, a listing of cars, red cars that are Toyota, Yaris, 2010 onwards. So I configure a view like that. Once I configure the view, like I filter the information, I can decide how to present it. And I can present it in many different ways. For example, an HTML table, an RSS feed that is XML, a PDF document, and CSV or Excel document, an interactive map, a slideshow, a JSON representation for a backend application. So the same content can be presented to the user in more than one way. And in fact, one single view can be used to present like the table and the CSV download, for example, like with one single view. Um, a visual example of this, you know, this is a, a view. In this case, you see like, you, you will say this is a page, like the main content. This is not a node, this is a view. So um, in this case, this is a view of nodes of type car. And then uh, if, if you look at the first column, it says the play, the year, the make, and the model. It is important to know that internally, those are separate fields. But when I am configuring the view, I can concatenate uh, fields together to present them in one single column. And you know, that is the flexibility that this provides. I also have images. One thing that is not evident, but all the images are of the same size. You know, it is possible that you know, all of us are uploading content and let's say we take that picture using our phones. 
phones have different resolutions, you know, it varies a lot. But Drupal has a system called image styles, which automatically resize the images so they are all the same, so you are consistent. And I have other columns. Uh, it is the, the image is cropped, but at the bottom I have a pager. So a pager is like, I don't want to load 500 cars in one single page. You know, it will make the page lower slower because of all the images. So I can say, I can only, I want to show five at a time. So I show five and then a pager at the bottom. I click second page, third page, and so on. The thing uh, that when I have a table, not all of them, but some fields, I can make them sortables. So let's say that I can make the first column sortable based on the year. Or the, if I have a number, I can make it sortable. Or if I have a text, I can make it sortable by a, in alphabetical order. So you, uh, when you have a table, you can make it sortable. On top of that, the thing that you see between the table and the label cars, that is called exposed filters. So let's assume that I have some predefined uh, information that I want to present, but I want to give my users the, the flexibility to like e even narrow down the search to what they are specifically looking for. So I can expose the year field so they can search like year 2013. If they apply that filter, then the view will like the visual appearance will remain the same, but the results are going to show only cars from 2013. And I can do the same for make, model, like for every field. That's why fields are important. I can use a field as an exposed filter. And also for sorting. Uh, one last thing that I want to mention about this page, the main content of, of the page is a view. On the right, I have a small block with the, is, uh, with the image of a car. That is also a view. One thing that I said is that views are used for listing of content. At least myself, when I think about listing, I think of two or more elements. But in this case, there is only one. If you have a really good site, you will be able to see that on top of the car, it says random car. So some cases where only one element makes sense is when you want to show random information. So if you go to the website and you refresh the page, the main table is going to remain the same. It's going to show the same information always. But the car, like every time you refresh, it's going to be different. So it's going to be random. So random stuff or the most visited, the most commented, the most important, you know, those kind of things are good use cases of, of listings of ones. And usually you can accomplish those using views. Why so much theory? Isn't it boring? I, I do think it's boring to have too much theory, but bear with me. In Drupal, we love nesting. Like, you know, we love nesting markup. So if you want to show one little piece of text, you have like 10, 20 de level dips of dips. I don't know why we're getting better, but you know, we, we love them so much that we don't get rid of them completely. If you are up, uh, if. Uh, so in Drupal, we love nesting concepts. So, you know, these are called Matroska, Russian dolls, and the, the play here, you know, you open one, there is one in the, another one inside, you open, another one inside, you open, another one inside, so one inside of another, inside of another. In Drupal, we nest concepts. So, an example, let's say we have uh, more articles by the same author blog. Every blog needs to be placed in a blog region. So, at the very least, I have the blog region. Inside that block region, let's call it the right sidebar, I have the block itself. Let's assume that the block was used, was created using a view. And the view is a listing of notes. And the notes are is displaying field information like the title, the year, and something else, you know, some information. So for only one block, I have five layers of abstractions. Let's assume that I have a block that was not created using a view. Then I have the theme region and the block. Let's say that I have a view of users. The blue square is going to change from node to users. And this is only for one block of the page. I can have many blocks in the page. So it is important when you're working with Drupal to understand what you're dealing with. Is this a node? Is this a block? Is this a theme region? Is it an, a, a field? You know, because for every single concept, there will be a configuration page. So if you want to modify how nodes are presented, oh, this is a node, I go to the node 
field configuration page. This is a field, and go, I go to the field configuration page. And as you can imagine, if you have 30 blocks, you can have like 30 times five abstraction of this, one on top of the other. So um, I'm going to leave it uh, to there. Thank you very much for, for having me today. And if you have questions, you know, I will be around. Thanks.